Hi, uh, I'm Nuri Rubini, Chairman of Rubini Global Economics. Uh, welcome to today's Economic discussion. I'm here today with uh, Patrick Chavanaki, who is a professor at Tsinghua University. And we're going to be talking about what's going on in China today. There's a lot of discussion about, of course, the economy, whether it's going to achieve uh, a soft landing or a hard landing. Uh, recent data suggest the deflation of real estate both commercial and residential. The question is how serious it is. There's also something of a slowdown in export growth, especially to the Eurozone that is in a recession. It looks like even a fixed investment, especially infrastructure, might be slowing down as the railway ministry and others are starting to cut back on some of the ambitious infrastructure projects. So uh, how much of a slowdown in the first quarter and throughout the year? Is it going to be severe? Is it going to be mild? Uh, what do you think, Patrick? Well, you summarized the problems rather well. Um, you know, this is an economy that really since the, the, the dawn of the global financial crisis has been driven by investment. And uh, if you look at the last year's GDP growth, 9.2 percent, five percentage points of that came from investment in fixed assets. So uh, there's a lot of capacity being created, capacity in housing, capacity in infrastructure, in produ production. And the critical question is, who's going to use this capacity? Uh, in the past, it was external demand provided the, the users for this capacity. That doesn't look like it's going to materialize this year. So they're thrown back to domestic demand. And although there's a recognition in China that they need to develop the domestic economy, uh, the investment boom is really driven by uh, the policies that favor and, and redistribute uh, resources away from the uh, savers and consumers in China to subsidize and boost investment in production. So you'd have to see a wholesale reversal of that. And so, so going into 2012, the really critical question is, in the absence of external demand, in the absence of really re re driving up internal demand in the way that it needs to happen, uh, can they keep the investment boom going? And, and signs seem to be that there's significant deceleration of investment. How much of a deceleration, let's say, what do you think uh, first quarter and economic growth could be year over year or quarter over quarter annualized? Well, the challenge here is, uh, are we talking about official numbers or are we talking about the underlying real numbers? Because if you go back to spring of 2009, when China was hit by the global recession and, and, and the downturn in export demand, uh, you know, they, they, they reported um, around 6.5% GDP growth for the first quarter. but uh, if you look at output for electricity, if you look at uh, tr uh, traffic, uh, transportation traffic, it, it all looked like everything was in contraction. So, uh, you know, so what's your best I've, I've heard from people who are, who are telling me that every sector that they see is yeah. in contraction right now. Yeah. Um, I don't think that you'll see negative GDP numbers being reported, but, but, uh, but right now uh, it seems to be that there's an actual contraction going on. So. But well, let's say so we, we at RG were expecting that maybe if you do quarter of a quarter at the annualized rate, the first quarter might be as low as five or six percent. That is very low by Chinese standard. You right. think that actually the actual right. number and, could and be that's, lower you know, than that? That's what most people would consider as hard landing territory. Yeah. And I mean, you know, just if you look at what's going on in real estate right now, um, you know, just to maintain zero percent growth, they have to build all the things that they built last year. Um, and if you did that, if you built all the things that you built last year and no more, which is a massive amount of building, um, that would shave about two and a half percentage points off of GDP and if, with everything else remaining equal. Um, you broaden that out because real estate is really only part of a broader investment boom. Like I say, I mean, five percentage points out of, out of uh, 9.2 were accounted for by this investment boom. If you built all the roads, bridges, apartment buildings, malls, uh, airports, all these things that is, have been sustaining a Chinese economy, you built the same amount this year or this quarter that you did last year, you get 0% growth, that shaves, that, that brings uh, China's, real, China's uh, real growth down to about 4.2%. I mean, that's, 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 much, that's a much uh, uh, more rapid slowdown than most people are discussing. Yeah, but let's assume for a moment that this uh, sharp slowdown, close to hard landing, does occur. Uh, then, you know, there'll be a policy response. 
And we know that uh, historically, they need a growth rate closer to 8% to maintain social and political instability, stability. So the question is, could they do much better in the second half of the year with the weak first half so they achieve at least 8% growth? So they can reduce the triple R reserve requirements, they can cut the policy rates. Uh, they, of course, are constrained how much they can do credit growth. They're going to try to do more traditional fiscal policy, transfer payments to the households, maybe boost some of the social housing. Uh, which one of this policy action do you think they're going to take? And do you think they're going to be able then to reaccelerate the growth in the second half of the year so that the average growth rate of the economy is going to be closer to 8% for the year, year over year? Or you think they're going to be significantly below for the year? Well, everybody in China is talking stimulus. Everybody's talking easing. Yeah. But the challenge of actually, there's a challenge, there's some serious obstacles to making that happen. Mm -hmm. um, right now, they're really caught in a vice between, on the one hand, the need to roll over bad debt within the system, which means that the credit that's in the system is basically occupied. Uh, in, it's locked into existing projects. It, it's not available to finance new projects. If you want to finance new projects, that means uh, that you have to expand credit. But the, the PBOC, China's central bank, is very wary about easing and expanding credit because they believe that there's still um, inflation is, is still a real concern. I mean, they pumped in so much money over the past few years. Uh, China's, uh, uh, China's money supply has expanded by about two thirds and they weren't pushing on a string. I mean, they were, they were pushing on a, a, a full multiple um, in terms of lending. So, uh, so they're very reluctant to, to ease. Uh, because of the PBOC's reluctance to ease, there's been a shift in discussion in China towards uh, towards fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people will look at that and say that uh, uh, China has a lot of bullets in its chamber to be able to fire in fiscal policy because it's, it has uh, around a 30% debt to GDP ratio. Uh, I think that's a bit deceptive because you have to look at the contingent liabilities of the government. The central government is on the hook for bailing out the banks, bailing out local governments, bailing out Ministry of Railroads, bailing out probably the trusts, some of the real estate market, um, the contingent liabilities, when people add them up, it's somewhere between 100 and 200% uh, public debt to GDP already. So what, what will end up happening, I fear, is that they will turn on the fiscal taps, but what they'll end up doing is it will be revealed that the monetary stimulus of the past three years was really just disguised fiscal spending, and they'll end up paying for the last three years' worth of growth and not actually generating new growth. Well, you know, you're absolutely right that actually the amount of debt is much higher than the one officially reported. We RG estimated actually, if you add out all the state and local and the other debts, <clears throat> even the stock of debt leaving aside unfunded might be closer to 80% of GDP today. So the deficit is probably larger than the official 1% they reported for last year. But just today, the IMF came with this idea that if the uh, Eurozone economy is going to be as weak as people expect it to be, with downside risk to grow to China because a lot of the experts of China go to the Eurozone. They should do more fiscal stimulus. They should have at least an official budget deficit of 2% of GDP, if not higher, rather than 1% of GDP. So they have this fiscal room of maneuver, even if you're right, and over time, uh, you know, given all the implicit liability. So can they do that stimulus fast enough and it's going to make a difference for the economy between the monetary and the fiscal? Or at the end of the day, the year is going to end up to be much weaker than people expect in the consensus? They can, they can turn the tap on. Um, the, the real issue is whether they can keep the investment boom going. Um, because you know, if they pour money into the economy, I mean, there's an open question about whether it will actually reignite an investment boom. Given what's especially happened in asset prices and real estate, um, it's an open question whether people will actually jump right back in into assets, uh, whether they can necessarily reflate the bubble. Mm -hmm. um, there's two other options. You know, one is that the money goes towards consumption, which should be good, but, but, uh, but will also uh, spur inflation in China. And uh, the other option is that it actually leaves the country. Um, and we, st we, we actually are seeing now signs of, not I wouldn't call it capital flight, but certainly capital moving out of China, mm -hmm. um, at least certainly enough to counter the current account surplus and, uh, and actually put downward pressure on the renminbi, and China's actually over the past couple of months been drawing down slightly on reserves. But I mean, that, that really raises the question about whether pumping more money into the economy will actually generate the growth that they desire or whether they will end up pushing on a string. Well, speaking about the currency right now, 
you know, there's an election in the United States. There is a delicate political transition with the choice of the new premier and president by the end of the year in China. Uh, you know, the large trade deficit within U.S. and China on a bilateral basis is still very large, even if the overall trade surplus of China is slightly smaller relative to the rest of the world. As some of the Republican candidates are saying, let's be tough on China. Uh, the rate of crawl and appreciation has slowed down and maybe they might reverse. Uh, what do you see China's uh, exchange rate policy for the rest of the year? They're going to do just as much as in the past, less than the past. Uh, do you see a risk of a trade tension rising between the U.S. and China then, given this outlook? If growth does decelerate, you will hear uh, calls for China to um, devalue, uh, internally, I mean. Uh, you heard it back in 2008 and 2009. Uh, they resisted it at that time. They, they stopped appreciating, but they did not actually uh, push it downwards. Uh, I think mainly because of uh, concerns about the international backlash. Uh, they're well aware that, yes, I mean, the, the, if, they're, if they're searching for growth, one way of getting it is to devalue, but the international reaction could cancel out the beneficial effects of that uh, if, if it provoked uh, uh, Congress to actually pass and the president to sign a, a bill slapping sanctions on China, you know, it wouldn't really help Chinese exports. So, but Leaving aside even outright depreciation, even if just China were to go back to an effective uh, semi-peg and let the crawl to be so small it's close to zero, I think that the reaction in the U.S. might be very negative. The U.S. was sort of accepting yes. a rate of crawl of closer to 6-7% per year was not ideal, but better than nothing. But if it slows down significantly towards zero, that will be a source of tension or not? Well, I think, you know, politically it will be a source of tension. I think the, the people in the administration who craft this policy know that uh, there are really two aspects to China's adjustment. One is uh, external price adjustment, or the exchange rate, and the other is internal price adjustment, that is inflation. So uh, really you get adjustment one way or the other. Uh, if you don't adjust extra, the exchange rate, you're going you're gonna to fuel inflation, which is something that China has done. And that, that, will, that will end up pushing prices up within China, pushing cost of production up within China, and will have, in effect, the same effect of, as, as a change in, in external prices. I mean, it's exactly the opposite of what's going on in Greece right now, where uh, you know, the question is, do you, do you devalue or do you, or do you have... Um, or, or, or do you have uh, deflation? Uh, deflation, as well and, and so and so in China, the issue is, you know, do you appreciate or do you have inflation? Yeah. Yeah. The, net, the, the net result is the same. The difference is who bears the burden. You know, with with uh, the change in the exchange rate, it's producers uh, and their employees who bear the burden. With uh, with inflation, it's Chinese savers and consumers that bear the burden. Yeah, if you slow down the rate of appreciation, however, inflation is going to rise, but maybe more slowly than. Mm -hmm. And the real appreciation will occur more slowly than if you had but the normal already, appreciation. You know, but right? we're already starting to see it, though. I mean, the, the, you know, one of the things that, that caused the uh, financial crisis that unfolded in Wenzhou was that you had exporters who were really uh, feeling a crunch, not just because of the stronger RMB, but also because of mainly because of rising input prices, both wages and, and inputs, uh, that were really putting them in a bind. And they, they said, look, I'm looking around and seeing all these asset uh, prices go up. Well, I'm going to turn my export firm into a, uh, a mini hedge fund and borrow and lend and, and try to play that game. And of course, they got burned. But, but that's the thing that kind of uh, uh, tempted them into doing that. Yeah. Now, looking more medium term, we know that the growth part of China is unsustainable, is unbalanced, uh, too much reliance on net exports and exports, on fixed investment close to 50% of GDP, high savings, consumption barely above one third of GDP. And every five years they have a five year plan saying we should increase the share of consumption. That never happens. Now there'll be a political transition. Some people say the new ruler is going to take time until they establish their own power and influence so they cannot do anything radical. But this unsustainability of this path, where you have to reduce fixed investment, you have to increase consumption, otherwise there is a risk of a hard landing by next year or 2014, is a fundamental question. So uh, will the new ruler accelerate some of those reforms to turn China into a consumer society, or are they going to do little and too little too late, and eventually a hard landing is unavoidable? Or how do we see this outlook for the Chinese economy? Well, right now, uh, because of the leadership transition, which will uh, take place in the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, there's just a lot of reluctance to take any kind of step to rock the boat. Um, you know, If anyone has political capital in the Chinese political system, they're going to use it to secure their place at the table uh, in the coming leadership 
uh, not to stick their neck out or upset important constituencies. And remember, you know, some of uh, some of the the people who actually sit at the table and decide who who will be the new leaders of China, um, they're heads of SOEs, they're they're important uh, people who have a stake in in uh, the current economic growth model of China. So, so really, and, and, re, you know, and, and remember, I mean, even after the leadership transition takes place, when President Hu took power, he really spent the first five years, his first five-year term, putting his protégés into position, as opposed to actually embarking upon some kind of 100-day plan or something like that uh, in the first few days. Now, what could well, change China that? China cannot afford another five years of well, <laughs> no change, but right? But you know, the, the thing that's going to change that is that, that uh, the economy is not necessarily going to move on their timetable. I mean, their timetable would be they'd like to kick it down the road as long as possible and avoid decisions. Uh, the world may not wait for that. And, uh, and so even before the leadership transition, they may have to make some tough decisions that they prefer not to, to make. Does it mean that they're going to avoid then that hard landing or eventually the investment bust is going to imply that uh, with consumption still being very low as a share of GDP? Uh, there'll be that hard landing down the line. I mean, I think we're seeing elements of a hard landing right now. I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the unraveling of the real estate sector, not only is it a, an important component of GDP growth, but also uh, land and the assumption of ever-rising land prices is one of the linchpins that, that uh, has driven uh, uh, lending and growth in China for the past uh, several years. So, so we're, I think we're already starting to see it. And, and so no, we're the question, the question then is when you go uh, into the spring, you know, how much will a stimulus help? I think yeah. it'll probably kick the can down the road a little bit, but not, not as much as they'd like. Um, and uh, I think they're, I think they're going to be facing some hard decisions uh, this spring and in, in, in the summer. There's a lot of debt coming due um, that will have to be rolled over in the real estate sector. The need to finance infrastructure uh, and, and drive that growth. I mean, that's, it's, it's, the, the system's coming under a lot of stress. And, it and it's not coming under stress on their, on their time frame. Yeah, I mean, but for this year, they could try to kick the can down the road. More fiscal stimulus, more monetary, more credit for another year while the transition occurs. But of course, then you're pushing the problem 2013-14 and the fundamental problem of rebalancing the economy and moving it away from net exports and fixed investment to our consumption could be postponed for a while longer. But you're saying it's already becoming think harder thing, this year. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing, the, the, the real dis, the, the tension between, on the one hand, driving investment growth through credit expansion and on the other hand, credit expansion fueling inflation. And the, the incompatibility between those two things has really reached a a crisis point because, uh, and, and, and the thing that's really intensifying that is the need to roll over debt. The, you know, no longer are we talking about bad debt as sort of a theoretical possibility. We're talking about it as a, a real thing that needs to be dealt with within the system and it's eating up the available credit within the system. So you, if you want to drive growth, you have to do it through credit expansion. If you expand credit, then you're courting inflation. And that, that, that trade-off has become much more intense than it was a year ago or two years ago. Now, throughout the world, we've seen a significant amount of social and political instability. You know, it was not just the Arab Spring, it was the Occupy Wall Street in the US, it was the riots in London, the middle class in uh, Israel say, I cannot afford the homes. Uh, uh, you know, the students in Chile say, I cannot afford good education and anti-corruption drive in India. Now what's happening in Russia? And some of it is fed also by, you know, social media allowing this aggregation. Now in China, you cannot demonstrate on the streets. If you go to Tiananmen Square, they're going to arrest you. But now they've blocked Facebook, they've blocked Twitter, but they have their own version of it, Weibo, where you know, up to three, 400 million Chinese now can express their views. And they're complaining about corruption, about the lack of democracy, about uh, inequality rising and so on. Uh, could there be something that's going to lead to a Chinese spring of some sort, or this is totally far-fetched? I mean, what's the risk? Well, system. you know, one of the uh, members of Chinese Politburo who's responsible for uh, internal security did come out uh, earlier this year and say that they were uh, wi watching very closely uh, the situation, especially because of the economic stresses, that they were concerned about social stability. Uh, so, th you know, it's definitely something that is well on their on the radar screen. Uh, you do see instances of social unrest. You know, there was uh, in, in southern China, there was a village, uh, Wukan, where the villagers 
not so much because of the downturn, actually, but because of the boom. Uh, and and uh, local officials were grabbing land and not making profit yeah. off of it. Uh, they they actually occupied the town and kicked out the officials. And there was a standoff, which which uh, fortunately uh, was resolved uh, peacefully, uh, at least for the moment. And and uh, and so you know the government. I think the government. Uh, um, it realizes there are stresses. It tries to. Resp I think it tries to respond to those stresses initially uh, through some kind of accommodation, which is like what, what happened in Wuhan. Uh, but uh, if not, you know, they don't have a problem bringing out the mailed fist. And, and the one thing that they took away from Tiananmen, rightly or wrongly, uh, was a nip it in the bud. So even a hint of any kind of uh, organized protest uh, is usually clamped down upon pretty strictly. Yeah, organized protests, yes, but now social media allow you to virtually protest. Social media protest, has really changed right? the game because Weibo, Completely. you know, the th we used to hear uh, And now they want people to years. register their names, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, used, anonymous. we used to hear in previous years about, oh, there was an instance of unrest in some city and there was just a one-line news item. And now we get pictures, we get eyewitness accounts, we get videos, and it's shared and it's taken down. You know, it's put up on Weibo and it's taken down by the authorities three hours later, but in those three hours, it's spread all over China yeah. and everybody knows that it's happened. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, the technology has really changed the game and, and, you know, the Chinese government is, I think, struggling to cope. And I don't know how long they'll permit something like Weibo. Um, there are people in the Chinese government who but believe that Weibo is out of the important. battle, really. Well, you know, they cannot go and say, now three, four hundred million people cannot express themselves on Weibo, right? Well, really there, are, there, are people, there are people who, in the Chinese leadership who believe that, and they believe that Weibo plays an important role in, um, in letting the leadership know about uh, things that people are concerned about. Uh, on the other hand, there are people who I think would unplug the Internet tomorrow if it was their choice. <laughs> so... So it'll be an interesting year, you know, weakness in economic growth, risk of a hard landing, delicate political transition, you know, Weibo, and the social media affecting also the way people perceive China and its leadership. So it's going to be a very, very interesting year. And we're going to be following it with you and others as well. So thanks very much. Uh, this was today's Econo Monitor discussing the chances of a hard landing in China and the economic and political changes occurring. And stay with us as we'll cover this topic as much as other ones on the econommonitor.com as well. Thank you. Bye.